Ukraine, movies, politics, a true a dark horse maverick, former Minnesota Governor Jesse Ventura, host of the hit TV show on True TV, Conspiracy Theory, going into its third season. Uh, number one New York Times bestseller over and over again. His latest book, 63 Documents the Government Doesn't Want You to Read. He's got a new book coming out soon as well. The prolific Jesse Ventura joins us for the next hour. And he, he told me some pretty hardcore stuff yesterday, but said I couldn't talk about it. Today, he said, I might want to talk about it. He'll make the decision. And we'll talk about it later in the hour if he wants to. Governor, good to have you here with us. Great, Alex. Always a pleasure to be here. It's uh, ugly, rainy weather today up in Minnesota, so that's why I agreed to do an hour with you because I can't play golf. <laughs> you're something you're, else. You're the only, golf is the only thing that will stop me from doing you, Alex. I know. You're very, very nice, sir. <laughs> Before we get into all the serious issues, now your wife, Terry, is so great. It was great seeing her out at your birthday party in Los Angeles. But yesterday I call up and I go, yeah, Jesse said call Monday to get him on this week. She said, oh, great. Well, he's on the elliptic and the dog's on the treadmill. And they watch sports together. And I said, my God, that'd be the ultimate sports center video. And she goes, no, 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 no. He'd get mad at me. And I said, no, I'm just joking. But, but you got to tell us about uh, your dog and uh, about the treadmill action. Well, it's, it's you know, I, I always like to keep myself in shape. You know, I, I try to do that. I think it's even more important as you get older to continue to train and you know, keep you uh, physically in shape as much as you can. And so I try to work out light with weights in the morning, and then I do the elliptic machine after. And uh, right now I do six miles at a pop on it, you know, which is pretty good. And, uh, you know, my dog, uh, uh, when I first started training, he, he loves to participate in anything that I do and wants to be around me or my wife constantly. And so he immediately looked like, what do I do during all this? And he got up on the treadmill and we turned it on with no training at all. And he now runs on the treadmill while I do the elliptic machine. And, and of course, I got a TV screen in there. And uh, if The Young and the Restless is on, we watch that. If it's before that, we watch The Price is Right or we watch Sports Center, depending on what time of the day it is. But, uh, yeah, he trains with me every morning and it's kind of nice to be able to do that. And even when the weather gets bad here in Minnesota, that's what's good about it. We can train indoors. So it's a, it's a good thing. And, you know, dogs will adapt to treadmills. I don't think they'll, if, if they are allowed to be introduced to them in a, in a good manner and not get frightened of them in any way, shape, or form, a dog will run on a treadmill, and it's a great way to keep them in shape. And like on today's days like today in Minnesota when it's raining out all day, saves you from having to go outside. Well, especially a prized German Shepherd. Now, 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 he has a public name, and then he has his real name. Uh, but uh, this is a—I mean, this is a well-trained German Shepherd, really smart. Oh yeah. Well, actually, he's not a German Shepherd. He's a Belgian Malinois. Okay. Well, it looks like a German Shepherd to me. I'm ignorant. Well, well, no, you're not ignorant. They look very much alike because uh, years and years ago, the uh, German Shepherd, I believe, came out of the Belgian Malinois. Oh. He is just called a, a Belgian Shepherd. You have a German Shepherd and a Belgian Shepherd. And they're slightly different. Uh, the, the Belgian's a little bit smaller, doesn't get the hip displacement problems because your German Shepherds are big. You know, they get 90 to 110 pounds or more. And uh, any dog that gets that big is going to have the problem of the hip displacement stuff or, or run the risk of it. Not saying they all will, but they run a greater risk where the Belgian Shepherd is about 75, between 70 and 80 pounds. And that, that 20 pounds difference can make all the difference, apparently, between the hip trouble, you know, and then, of course, a lot of it could be hereditary, too. Is uh, Dexter looking up at you right now, Governor? No, he's upstairs sleeping. <laughs> he, did his, he did his treadmill this morning, so along with me. So now he's taking a break while I talk to you. <laughs> so, uh, how many miles did the, did the uh, Belgian Shepherd do? Oh, I, I usually put him on there for about a half hour to 45 minutes. You know, uh, I don't keep track of the miles. I just set it at a particular pace and let him go for 30 to 45 minutes. It gives him good exercise. Incredible. Wow. All right, Governor, stay there. We're coming back to the full audience. We're going to get into a host of issues, election 2012, the TSA, and more with Jesse Former Ventura. Minnesota Governor Jesse Ventura is our guest, New York Times bestselling author, I don't know, four or five times over. His latest book, by the way, is available at Infowars.com. 63 documents the government doesn't want you to read. He's got some new books coming out as well. We'll see if we can get him to talk about that. Third season of the hit TV show that I think has had a lot of courage. Uh, conspiracy theory, getting into Rex 84, FEMA camps, 
the whole nine yards. We're going to talk to him about election 2012. He's got some breaking uh, comments on that uh, that he re uh, relayed to me yesterday uh, that, that are certainly newsworthy. Uh, also, we're going to be looking at uh, the TSA as much as he can say about his uh, lawsuit that the judge still hasn't ruled on. Um, we're talking about a long period of time here. That's all coming up. Uh, but out of the gates first with uh, Governor Ventura, uh, some breaking news yesterday. And I've actually gotten some calls about this separately, but I couldn't confirm it. But I do see that there are some publications here uh, that are talking about it. And uh, the uh, production company has told Ventura uh, that it's true. So if it isn't true, uh, it's an elaborate hoax. But uh, Governor Ventura, you want to tell folks what's going on with the TV show? Well, we're in the middle of production of our third season. And, uh, you know, we've settled on eight more conspiracies, uh, some of them very bizarre. It's going to be an interesting year. We've changed personnel a little bit. We've... Uh, brought on board my son, Tyrell, who will now be on camera. Last year he was simply off camera and working behind the scenes as a producer. Uh, he's a good-looking kid and belongs in front of the camera. He hates it. He wants to be behind it. But uh, like everybody, they, they, they may succeed at something that they don't generally isn't their first choice. But my son's coming on screen this year with me along with, uh, uh, along with uh, uh, Sean Stone, who is a very bright young man, a graduate of Princeton, and happens to be the son of Oliver Stone. So uh, that can only spell trouble when you see Ventura's teaming up with Stones. Uh, and it can only be trouble for our government, because uh, I'm a great admirer of Oliver Stone, and his son Sean is a chip off the old block. You know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. He's a brilliantly smart young man. And I'm going to he's kind of introverted, and I'm going to attempt on the show to make him a little more extroverted by the time we're done. But uh, what, what's happened, Alex, we're in production right now, and we were doing a very controversial show uh, that involved a Dr. Fred Bell, who is a, the brother of the famous uh, radio man, Art Bell. And he did a controversial interview with me just a day or two ago, three days ago, whatever it was. And uh, he's staying here in Minneapolis, and within 24 to 36 hours later, he's found dead in his hotel. Now, I see some YouTube videos on this, so it's broken. And I see Godlike Productions talking about it, you know, asking if it's true. Uh, you say the production company believes it's true. Uh, and I know you've been investigating. Uh, and so well, we're still on 100% uh, confirmed on this, but certainly it's out there now. Uh, and, uh, I mean, Jesse, specifically, I know you, well, because you probably well, don't want to get into what you were talking to him about, or perhaps you do, uh, but uh, we need to find out if this is true or not. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I'm going under the assumption that it is because, like I said, I had a conference call with my production company out in Los Angeles yesterday, and they were all speaking at it absolutely positively that uh, Dr. Fred Bell is indeed dead. Uh, tragically, uh, a very interesting man to talk to, to say the least. A uh, very well-read man, an exceptionally educated man. He's he's a direct in-line descendant of Alexander Graham Bell. I didn't know if you knew that. No, I didn't. Yeah, he's a direct descendant of him, you know, and obviously with the same last name, Dr. Fred Bell. And, uh, or at least that's what he told me, and I can only take him as a man of his word. Uh, he's very much and has been involved in many U.S. government operations, uh, both as a consultant and who knows what else. Uh, and he told me some very interesting things that will be revealed on the show, which I'm not at liberty to reveal right now. But it is, if, if he did, if it's just a simply tragic circumstantial happening that he happened to do these controversial interviews with me, and then within 48 hours is dead, I don't know. I don't know if there's more to it. I can't make any statement that there is or isn't at this time. It may be just circumstance. It may have been just his time to go. I don't know. But in the words of Colonel L. Fletcher Prouty, who I now hold deeply to me all the time, Prouty said nothing just happens, everything is planned. And so that always rings in the back of my mind a little, Alex. But uh, I don't want to put anything more into it. He may have just simply, that was his last day on Earth. I don't know. Certainly, but, uh, I mean, good, good but to me. It just seems very strange. 
that that uh, that he would he would leave this planet after in less than 48 hours after doing an explosive interview with me. You've told me the topic off air, and and that's what makes it even more creepy because I have seen a lot of strange things happen in and around that particular uh, topic. Um, but I, I guess we'll just leave it at that. Yeah, yeah. But uh, you know, Dr. Fred Bell, brother to brother to Art Bell. You know, everyone knows him from, I believe, coast to coast, right? Yes. With Art Bell, probably one of the biggest radio shows in United States history. And uh, Fred Bell was an exceptional, bright scientist type, extremely smart man. And uh, the thing, some of the things he revealed me was as intimate dealings with the U.S. government on many, many highly top-secret type operations and top-secret type projects that were probably even way beyond what I was as a Navy SEAL. You know, I, I would be down, uh, the Navy SEALs are down at the knuckle-dragger level. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, well, we are. We're the ones that go out and physically do the jobs. Dr. Bell would be at a level where those are the brain trusts, the way up there that eventually can lead to some SEAL type operations, certainly. But uh, you know, he's up in the in, in the in that stratosphere beyond anything that I would have ever been even close to with my top secret security clearance when I was in the Navy. And we know there's a lot of other shadow stuff going on, like when you had just become governor and they called you down in the Capitol basement and there were 23 CIA agents. Well, not really. I agreed to do it. They they called it a, a, a they they listed it as a classroom thing. That's what it officially was called. <laughs> and they asked if I would be participate in it. So it wasn't that sneaky, Pete. I mean, I could have turned them down, Alex. It wasn't that I was required to, but it, it piqued my interest, and I thought this will be interesting. Sure, but it goes to your point that I know you've made that they look like your neighbor. Without a doubt, without a doubt, and uh, there's a lot more to this story that, as it progresses, I don't want to say anything right now, Alex, of anything behind the scenes that I know. But I'll just say this: He told me some very provocative things that I think that I will have to go to the police with. Things that he told me in our interview off the air that I think that I will have to let the local police know what he told me. Wow. So, yeah, because yesterday when you told me about this, you said, don't, you know, don't get into it. We're not going to talk about it. But then this morning, right before you came on, you said, you know what? I think I'm going to have to talk about this. And then we had to go live. So I think that's what you were alluding to is that is that this is stuff you're not going to be able to keep quiet about. Well, uh, you know, but my first obligation is to inform the authorities of what was said to me. Yes. And not, and not the general public. Yes, no, that makes sense. Then after that point, we'll, we'll see what happens from there. But uh, I do want to talk to them. Well, this is certainly a big deal. Tyrell, I know, is having to come in from California to deal with this. Yeah, yeah. And, well, whether it's a big deal or not, we don't know. You know, it, it may be tragically that the man just died, Alex. It could be as simple as that, too. Well, as bad as it is, let's 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 hope for the lesser of two okay. evils. Yeah, and as, as it progresses, I'll keep in touch and let you know. Well, thank you, sir. Now, sure. now let's shift gears into, uh, speaking of Navy SEALs, uh, when we first had you on last time, the whole Navy SEAL thing had just happened, and you did say it was suspicious to you. I have talked to the father of a Navy SEAL known by my family for about 18 years, and I mean, they, you know, I don't, I don't want to get too much into it and give it away, but I've seen the photos. I've had family that's met the Navy SEAL. He was friends with one of the people that was, in fact, let's just skip this network break coming up. He was friends. Well, actually, I was told not to give too much away. The point is, is that the SEALs do believe, and I have this from another source as well, from, from the wife of a SEAL, but this is directly known by, by me, yeah. that that they were put on that helicopter that blew up, that killed the 20-something SEALs, and that it was a National Guard helicopter, that they thought something was weird, that they never put that many on the same helicopter, and, and that they believe that a bomb was put on board. And then their only question is, did Al-Qaeda do it or was it the government? But, but, but they think there's foul play, and that some of the SEALs on there uh, were not just in SEAL Team 6, they were all SEAL Team 6, but that they had been on the Bin Laden raid. Well, first of all, Alex, 
let me correct you on something. All the Bin Laden raid SEALs were from SEAL Team 6. No, no, I know. I'm, I'm talking about the helicopter that later... Right, right. But, but, but all the SEALs that were on the Bin Laden raid were from SEAL Team 6, and as I understand it, all the SEALs that were on this helicopter likewise were from SEAL Team 6. Yes, sir, that's what I'm saying. And, and, and But there were more. There were like 22 of them. Yes. And the question is... And I, I, I know where you're going with this because I've thought about it also. The question is, were the same SEALs that were on the Bin Laden raid on this helicopter? And that, unfortunately, I don't know if we'll ever know because no one's even going to know who the Bin Laden SEALs were. Okay, I do know. This is what I'm telling you, and this is dangerous information. Okay, and again, this is directly... Well, ahead of me because I don't know. You know, all I know is it's a speculation that I took was, oh boy... The 22 SEALs that went down in this helo, were they the Bin Laden SEALs, and would they have done that to shut them up? Well, let's look at this from this perspective, Governor, and, and then I'm going to tell you what I was told, and I want to get your expert opinion on this. And again, I, 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 when I got you on as a guest, I hadn't even thought to bring this up, so it just popped in my head now, so I'm going back to the data, so it'll take me just a second to be exact here. Um, what I was told through a wife of a SEAL who was not in SEAL Team 6, but is currently serving, was that the SEALs got on the helicopter at the Bin Laden raid, this is what witnesses all saw, and that it blew up and had some type of bomb on it. They didn't blow it up. And that they were killed. And that Pakistani military came and got the bodies and got the helicopter. That has since come out on Pakistani TV. And that was that big diplomatic row and fight with their governments. But that was just from this wife of a Navy SEAL. And I confirmed she was who she said she was, but I... Well but, but, but let me interject something, though, Alex. <laughs> SEAL Team 6 is so secretive, wives don't even know about it. Well, I was going to go further, though. That's what I'm telling you. Because No, let me explain. I have a friend who was on SEAL Team 6, and his wife had no idea that he was. Well, That's this one... how secretive Team 6 is. No, I understand. Wives don't even know if their husbands are on that team. So I would be a bit skeptical of your information, of, you know on that basis alone. Well, listen, that's why I was saying I didn't go with that info because I couldn't confirm that. In this other case, this is a current SEAL who has a friend who is in SEAL Team 6. He was not in the helicopter, the second helicopter that went down. But that what he said is the SEALs are angry and think that either Al-Qaeda or somebody else set them up, put them on the National Guard helicopter, and that it was some type of assassination. So that's the info I have, and that is directly from the father of the Navy SEAL. Okay, I, I can't comment on that really because I know nothing about that, but uh, I don't know. I guess all I can say is, Alex, in light of the stuff I do and the information I've gathered doing my TV show and the other things I've looked at, Nothing is beyond, I don't put anything past anyone anymore. So I'm not going to say this could be true or couldn't be true, but I certainly wouldn't say that it, 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 it's not so. I can't say that, but it very well could be. Who knows? Let me ask you. That's where I'm at now, Alex. I don't trust my government at all. I mean, I just happened the other morning to watch the movie on Pat Tillman again. And, and every time I watch that movie, and I recommend people, it's on Showtime now, I think, or whatever, called the Pat Tillman story, I urge people to watch this and watch and see how despicable our government was in the death of Pat Tillman. And, and the worst part about it is the very end when all these generals and big shots are brought in front of Congress, and they, they say, I can't recall over 90 times. Over 90 times in their testimony, these guys obviously are suffering from bad cases of Alzheimer's. And I say that sarcastically, naturally. But at 90 sometimes, I watch the Pat Tillman show and, and I just fume with anger the Pat Tillman story. So I do not trust my government at all today. I don't trust a word that comes out of them. They're a major pack of liars. I don't think I can be any more blunt than that. Oh, I think you I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, take Private Lynch. We, uh, five of her team suddenly got killed when they came out and said that she wasn't the hero, they said. It was a PR stunt to get women in frontline combat. And they did the fake raid that Jerry Bruckheimer directed 
uh, via satellite on the hospital where they said, hey, come get her. And the Iraqis had pulled out two days before the Iraqi military. Uh, you have Pat Tillman basically being assassinated, the cover up of that that you were just that uh, you were just alluding to. But specifically, Governor Jesse Ventura, underwater demolition team, Navy SEAL, a whole nine yards. When you heard that members of SEAL Team 6, a part of the same unit, uh, went down the, the biggest one-day loss of life in the 10-year history of the Afghan war, and it just so happens to be the Navy SEALs, and as God is my witness, talking to the father of a Navy SEAL that my family's known for a long time, I'll just leave it at that, Okay. Uh, it says, yes, my son is good friends with somebody in six, and he told him that the whole team thinks that either Al-Qaeda put a bomb on it, but then they think it might be the government because it was real weird how they were all put on this junkie helicopter. They you know, never use these National Guard helicopters, and they usually split them up, and they thought the whole thing was suspicious. And, 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 and you know. Remember this, Alex. That's the first thing you look for in conspiracy and government. I'll, I'll just state this, and I have no knowledge. What you're telling me, I can't add to it. I can't say you're right or wrong. But I will say this, in all of my dealings in, in doing conspiracy theory and writing my book and doing everything I've been doing in the last over decade now, the thing you always look for with government is when there's a violation of standard operating procedures. When government violates a procedure that they normally do, will or won't do, whatever it might be, and believe me, it's that way in the military, it's that way in regular government. Everything government does is done under op standard operating procedures. When those are violated, that's your first sign that something isn't kosher. That's your first sign that you may have a, a cover-up, that you may have a conspiracy, if you want to call it that, whatever name you want to give wow. to it. But the first thing you look for is a violation of standard operating procedures. So if your SEAL is giving you the information that they will put on a helicopter that they don't normally fly... And if they and if yeah, this that and whatever and if things didn't seem normal and very out of sorts for what they were being asked to do, because th l let me put it to you this way: the seals today have unlimited money. It no, 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 no. That, listen, there. that's exactly to, that's exactly what the father said. We used to, Alex. We used to have to beg, borrow, and steal back in the Vietnam days. Because, it, because we weren't the number one unit then as far as guerrilla warfare, not in the guerrilla warfare community, but the focus of the general military back then was on conventional military. Today that focus has changed because conventional military today is obsolete. Today it's on small unit tactics and guerrilla warfare, which is the SEALs are the best. Also add in the Delta Force, who is very good, the Green Berets. The list goes on and on of the small unit guys and what they do. But uh, uh, So it seems strange to me that today when the SEALs have unlimited money and resources at their disposal, that they would all of a sudden put them on a helicopter that isn't one of theirs. They yeah. all are working together with their helo pilots, their boat drivers. That all took place after the fiasco in the desert of the Iran hostage raid. You remember that one? Sure, the Delta Force. Everything got all screwed up. Well, that changed everything at that point. And it changed it to the better, to where they put the helo pilots, the boat drivers, are all under the same command, and they work with the teams every day. Well, that's what I was going to say. That's exactly what the father was saying. I was just crystallizing it. But they said standard operating procedure wasn't followed. They used equipment they never used. They used a junkie National Guard helicopter. The mission was weird. They asked him, why are we going out to this site? Then they said it was SEAL Team 6 that was involved in the bin Laden raid in Reuters. Then they said it wasn't. Then they said they were going to after Taliban in a rescue mission. Then it wasn't. That was the whole point, was the whole thing was a lie. And that, quote, and again, they couldn't believe their own government did it, so they said it's as if al-Qaeda was like, had a mole or something and had put a bomb on there. Well, I think that's giving al-Qaeda a lot more credit sure. than they deserve. Sure, but the SEALs are then having to wonder, then, I mean, well, what happened? You, you know, again, Alex, I can only state that I, I don't trust the, my government officials at all today. 
Not one bit. Let me ask you this. What did you think the minute you heard that helicopter blew up? Well, naturally it gutted me because it's my teammates. It's my people. You know, it doesn't matter if you're an underwater demolition guy from World War II or the most elite guy on SEAL Team 6 today. We are all one fraternity. We are an elite fraternity of very special men who go through the most difficult training in the world in hopes of, of being the best sailor we can be and defend our country. And so what happens to me when I hear that, I cry. Because when they die, a little bit of me dies. That's how, that's how tight we are. And it doesn't matter through generations. I'm class 58, and today they're up to class, I don't know, 292 something or other way up there. I don't even know. But it doesn't matter. We are all brothers. And so when, when, when the seals die, I cry. It hurts. All right, Governor. Powerful information. Stay there. I want to get into 2012 election and more straight ahead. Former Minnesota Governor Jesse Ventura is our guest. In the time we have left in the rest of this hour, we'll get into the upcoming TV show uh, with Sean Stone, who looks just like Oliver Stone and really smart guy. Of course, uh, a, a, another a great uh, director in his own right and researcher, uh, Tyrell Ventura, another chip off the old block. Uh, so certainly the next generation of, of tyranny fighters uh, with the show Conspiracy Theory. Uh, Jesse, when you get him on, never talks about his books, but I would add that you support Jesse and his work and our work when you get them from us. Uh, it's uh, Jesse Ventura with Dick Russell. This is a great book. 63 documents the government doesn't want you to read. Available discounted at Infowars.com. And, of course, his last book, American Conspiracies, the one before this one, with Dick Russell, is also excellent. Before he leaves us, we'll talk about some of the new books uh, that are scheduled to be coming out as well. But, uh, Jesse, finishing up before we get into uh, TSA, before we get into to, uh, all these other subjects, during the break you were, you were saying something a little more. A, a light bulb was going off from your underwater demolition Navy SEAL days about the 22 crammed on with 12 others on board that helicopter. Well, the light bulb was, again, like we talked about, Alex, standard operating procedures, and generally a, a standard operating procedure, to the best of my knowledge in the SEALs, is it's one platoon per helo. And a platoon is to, uh, to, uh, 12 enlisted and two officers. So clearly, there was a, if that's true, there was a violation of standard operating procedure right there. There were too many SEALs on board one specific helicopter. Normally, they would have divided that into two to three helos. That is exactly what the father said his son, the Navy SEAL, said. And again, I know the family. Sure. Well, then things haven't changed that much because I've been out for 40 years, you know, but it's still pretty much the same rules would apply, I would imagine. Well, it's just incredible that the entire SOP was different, and then it just so happens to be, to be SEAL Team 6, uh, just, just uh, again, the biggest one-day loss in troops. Well, and I'll tell you the sad part about it being SEAL Team 6. These are all career men. You're not going to find a guy on SEAL Team 6 that's wet behind the ears and just left high school or college a year ago. These are all combat seasoned veterans, probably with two to three to four tours to Iraq and Afghanistan on regular SEAL teams. You know, and so SEAL Team 6 are guys that are, are, have been specially selected to do that type of work. Not that all the SEALs are, 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 could potentially be qualified for SEAL Team 6, certainly. But, uh, but 6 is, is, is basically made up of, you're not going to find many 22-year-olds, I don't believe, in Team 6. Most of the guys are going to be between... Uh, probably 27, 32 years old. And they've survived a lot of deadly missions. Oh, absolutely. Only to be blown out of the sky to keep something secret. I mean, it's come out now that the Bin Laden thing, they had a fake Situation Room photo. They lied and said Obama was watching it. Uh, they lied and said they had live feeds. They lied, well, threw you know, him in the Alex, water. Let's take it all the way back, then. Let's take the lies to where they go back to, and that's George Bush and these whole wars to begin with. Yes, you know, let's not let him off the hook either, because he's the one that put us in these wars. He's the one, 9-11 happened on his watch. 
And so to me, it goes back to Cheney, Bush, Rove, and that whole cast of characters even more so than Barack Obama. Certainly. Look, I don't, I, I've exposed them, but at the end of the day, Barack Obama saying, I don't need Congress to launch an attack in Libya. Then they oh, put I agree. You know, don't get me wrong. I, you know I'm an equal despiser of both the Democrats and Republicans, but I like to keep people focused on that they shouldn't have just one or two year memories, that these memories need to go back at least a decade. No, I agree with you. Uh, shifting gears into another area, when I was talking to you the other day, you said, Alex, I'm like a honey badger. I just don't care anymore. <laughs> It's uh, uh, my patriotism to this government is literally shredded. I don't have any anymore to the government, to the government that runs this country. I have no more patriotism for them. And it's a sad thing to hear, hear myself say that. Well, it's been taken over. But uh, I, I have no loyalty to this government of the United States anymore. Because uh, now to the people of this country, that's different. To the country, it's like my T-shirt that I sell now, Alex. You get it on my website. It says, "I love my country, not my government," and it's got Jesse Ventura written right on it. And I proudly wear that shirt. I love my country, not my government. And the government is made up of Democrats and Republicans, both. Well, Gov, you let's get into the TSA before we get into 2012. Sure. Right now. You said that you're going to make a big announcement if the judge throws out your case without even letting it go to trial. Uh, I talked to you last week. Uh, you said that you were happy to talk, but it's just your lawyer and, and uh, your opinion, but that it looks like the fact that she has waited so long that uh, your lawyer thinks that might actually lean towards the fact that she's getting it ready to make sure that it does go to trial. Uh, well, we don't know. There's no way to judge, Alex. You can, when it comes to federal judges, um, throw everything out the window. They're all different. You can't, you know, you have thoughts that, well, they're taking a long time, so obviously she's studying the case real well. Well, you'd like to believe that, but it might just be maybe she went on vacation and hasn't got to it. I don't know. With federal judges, you, you have no idea. All I can state is this. Any case like this has been ruled upon faster than this one. This is the longest any judge has held on to a case right now. I can state, state that unequivocally because it's been over two months. I went into court, I believe it was July 22nd or 21st, something like that. It was a, a couple days after my birthday. Uh, that's why I had to get back to Minnesota from L.A., which I had to drive, of course, because I can't fly. And so I drove back to Minnesota and got back uh, the night before I had to go into court. And so we went into court. It was like July 21st or something like that. Well, here we are already past September 21st, and there's no ruling yet. So it's been well over 60 days. Uh, generally, rulings always happen within 90. I'd like to believe mine will also. And when she rules, we'll know. But you can't read anything into anything with a federal judge, Alex, because they're all different. But I just think that it, well, she hasn't thrown it out. And that's the good thing. Now, uh, you're saying you're going to make a big announcement uh, if, if they... It's, if it's thrown out, I will definitely call a press conference. Absolutely. If, if my case is thrown, if they will not let me go in front of a jury and have a trial over my Fourth Amendment constitutional rights, then I absolutely will have a press conference. Well, I think that's important to do. And, and then also you said you'd pop in here after the press conference. But I, I hope the case goes forward because if it doesn't, this, I mean, this country is in deep trouble. I would think so, too. I mean, you know, although I have to tell you there was a vicious letter to the editor up here in the... St. Paul paper criticizing me for tangling up our court system with such a frivolous, frivolous, stupid thing. Well, Jesse, there's a reason nobody reads those rags anymore. They had a, <laughs> they had a USA Today poll last week. 85% are against what the TSA is doing and don't want the NFL under Homeland Security pressure to start having private security grab your wife's breasts, your genitals. They say everything will be groped from the ankles up. Uh, what's your view of that, Governor? It's already happening. 
It's already happening, Alex. I, I'm a season ticket holder with the Minnesota Lynx, you know, the women's basketball team. Yes. And two times in the last two games I've gone down there, they've stopped me to wand me. And the first one, I, the guy stopped me because I had my wallet and my keys in my front pocket. And he stopped me and said, excuse me, what's in your front pocket? And I looked at the kid, and I, and he was a, I said, I'm the damn governor. I said, don't make me have to sue you like I'm suing TSA. <laughs> I said, what difference does it make? I used to be the governor here. You know, use some common sense, young man. And I chewed his ass out. I showed him, I, I said, it's my wallet, my car keys. And then I got it again the last game. Well, technically, I guess they can do it because they're private industry. Yeah, but now they're saying it's going to be in shopping malls with TSA, Governor. And, and, and to be clear, because you may have missed it, all NFL games, you're going to actually get the genital grope that you talk about in, in your uh, lawsuit that I've witnessed you go under at the, uh, and Ron Paul said it's happened to him, uh, at the uh, uh, Atlanta airport. I mean, they are saying now that they're going to grab the breast of your wife, everything. That's it. I'm not taking my wife and kids to a football game. I would like to know how they expect to get the people in the stands by kickoff. No, no, that's what they said last week. They said add four hours to get in. They're saying get there four hours early now. Well, then when when I would just say this. If they do that, then I advocate a boycott of the National Football League and leave their stadiums empty. Incredible. Leave yeah. their stadiums. You know, that's what this country needs to do to rise up. We, the people, have to start speaking back. And it can be done simply. How about a day of the year where nobody flies? Yes. I would love to see that happen. Oh, I yeah, we talked about that. Forefront. I would be a promoter of it. Okay, let's, then, then, listen, we talked about this six months ago. We talked about it two months ago. Let's pick a date, Governor, right now, and let's announce the national no-fly day. Uh, what really scares them is the opt-out day. Uh, how about we, uh, you know, national no-fly day, national opt-out week. Let's pick a peak time. Uh, let's pick Thanksgiving, the week of Thanksgiving. I, no, not enough time to promote it, Alex. Oh. I think that to do something like this, you need to go at least a year and let it build up. Okay. You you wanna... know, I would tell you, how about, how about on our nation's birthday next year, the 4th of July? Okay, that's a good day. See, to me, that would be better because that way it gives it time to gain momentum. Yeah, that way it's like nine months. Okay, let's do it. Let's you know, it but I will all be for it. I mean, it's time for the people to stand up and tell these people that we're supposed to be a country of the people, by the people, and for the people. Not them. You know, th th right now, we're subservient to the government. Our forefathers did not have that in mind. That isn't what this country was supposed to be. The government was supposed to be subservient to us. Well, Governor, you always make the point of you'd rather face the danger. I mean, you can't stop a killer at a school or a killer at a mall. Let or... me tell you something, Alex. They're putting the people in danger at the airport. Will you, can I explain why? Sure. All right, here's why. If it, When I was in the teams, they taught us to think like our opponents, the enemy. If I were a suicide bomber, do you know where I'd go to blow up the most amount of people? I'd go to the uh, ch the check-in line. Exactly. You can walk right in from the outside. You can get in that line. There'll be at least 300 people because it S's in the whole floor. You wait till you get right in the middle. No one's checked you at that point. No one's done anything to you at that point. And you're in a crowd of 300 people, you then blow yourself up. It's, but that's it's like if there's ever a killing in a cornfield, are they going to say we've got to have random TSA in cornfields because a rattlesnake killed somebody in one? This idea that... Well, not even a rattlesnake. Let's say a terrorist gets somebody in the cornfield. Yeah, so now every cornfield in the country has to have TSA. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, well, the, the point, and, and it begs the bigger question, Alex, which is this, and this is the part of my court case that begs the bigger question. Why is it the government's job to provide security for the airlines when the airlines are private sector businesses? I agree with you. Well, one Why not have the airlines provide their own security? 
That way, you as a customer, like myself, up here, it's Delta. Delta bought out Northwest. 90% if I fly, my flights are going to be Delta. I could have a relationship, Governor Jesse Ventura, with Delta Airlines. I could walk out to the airport, show them my passport, and they wouldn't have to search me at all. Because they, as a private sector business, would know, gee, Jesse Ventura has been flying for 30 years. Exactly. Jesse Ventura poses no threat. Put him well, on the plane. Well, it's about being guilty until proven innocent. It's this idea that we're going to put our hands on you. We're going to take blood at checkpoints without warrants under federal grants. Well, we're going to have the federal government everywhere. It's Alex, I'll tell you what I see next. Here's what I see next. They're going to use illegal immigration to get us issued national ID cards. I agree. Ron Paul's talked about that. Oh, yeah. And then what's going to happen, each state is going to say, well, we don't want these illegal immigrants in our state, so we're going to have checkpoints on all the highways that lead out into our state where you're going to have to show your national ID in which to come into our state. No, I agree. It's dangerous. Which totally, totally violates the Constitution. And if we, the people, get sucked in on this one, and if people sit back and say, oh, yeah, keep me safe. I mean, aren't they listening to Ben Franklin when Ben Franklin said the famous quote, those that give up liberty for security shall have and deserve neither? Well, Governor, look at Mexico. They've got checkpoints down there, and they've got 40,000 dead in the last three years. Checkpoints. Right. And che I go through those checkpoints all the time down there. Yeah, checkpoints do not keep you safe. No. Because what do you think? The criminal's going to go through the checkpoint? No. Christ. I mean, it's so stupid. Well, the drug cartels just attack the checkpoints. Now, we're running oh, out it's, of... It's like Alex at the airports. To get on the tarmac, all you got to do is have a slide-through card. You know, like a credit card? You just slide it through a thing and you're out on the tarmac. Well, listen, I, I certainly don't have the money for a private jet, but I've got friends who've got private jets. And uh, Charlie Sheen's come to town and picked me up before. And you just pull right up and walk right through, no security, and I'm on the tarmac. Yeah, exactly. It's a fraud. It is a total fraud. Now, the listen. The thing is a total fraud. People better start waking up to it and stop sitting out there saying, oh, keep me safe. Protect me at the airports. Wow, J Jesse, so much good info. We've talked about so much common sense. What about Ron Paul? You know, I asked you on the phone. I said, Governor, are you going to run for president? Tell folks what you said. Well, first of all, if Ron Paul would quit the damn Republican Party and run as a libertarian, that's what he is. He's not a Republican. He's a libertarian. The libertarians have ballot access in all 50 states. Ron Paul could be the libertarians' candidate for president. That's what needs to happen. Get a, you know, let's elect a president that isn't a Democrat or Republican. Then Ron Paul takes me as his running mate. Why? Because I'm the best insurance policy he could ever have. There ain't nobody going to kill Ron Paul and let Jesse Ventura in there. <laughs> That's a good point when you made that. Well, Jesse, listen. You know, I talked to Ron Paul privately the, the last time he ran in this time, and I, he said, I don't know if I'm going to run, Alex. And I said, look, you're as smart as I am or smarter, uh, Congressman. You're going to win by injecting real issues, anti-war, all the rest of this stuff, pro-Constitution. you got to run. He said, no, you, that's, he, and he said, no, that's a good point. I probably am. I am telling Ron Paul here on air, and I'm saying it uh, to, to, to Ron Paul listeners and supporters, to let him know this, and I know it's already been run past him, he has said he'll only run using the Republican machinery because he has a real shot at winning. But if he doesn't win the Republican primary, if he runs as a Libertarian candidate, he will get the nomination, he'll get a strong showing, he could get double digits and be in the poll position like Ross Perot was before Bush threatened him and he dropped out. And Ron Paul does have a chance to win, and you could join the ticket, or you could be part of the cabinet if he offered it. But regardless, then he'd be in the main, main election challenging Obama and Mitt Romney or whoever else is there. Ron, I'm drafting Ron Paul. He must run as a libertarian if he loses the Republican primary. I agree. I agree wholeheartedly with that. And I'm telling you, if Ron Paul took me as a running mate, we wouldn't just do well, Alex. We could win. I know, people love you. that right from me, because I never enter races with the thought of just doing
doing well. Jesse Ventura doesn't do things just to do them well. Jesse Ventura does things to win, to be the best. I didn't join the underwater demolition SEAL team, the most elite unit in the U.S. military, just to do something well. No, I understand. I did it because I like being the best. But, but my and, point... And Ron Paul can win. It's out there. All you've got to do is activate and get the, the, the silent voters out to vote. Yeah, that, that 30, 40, 50 percent that calls themselves independent sitting out there. Uh, on the 50 percent that don't vote. Yes. You have to give them a reason to see their vote work. It would create incredible excitement. It would create unbelievable excitement if Ron Paul and I ran as the libertarian ticket. Well, Ron Paul's a great guy. He's got a lot of great people around him. He also has some mainline kind of Republican people uh, who, uh, but no. Uh, so you're reaching out to Ron Paul right now? No, I'm just saying his, I would be his best choice because I'd be a great insurance policy, Alex. Yes, sir. They're well, not going to do anything to him, and that would put me in charge. <laughs> I think they're far better off with Ron Paul than they are Jesse Ventura as far as somebody who, you know, would cause them major problems. Well, uh, yeah. just incredible information, Gov. But I want to be clear where I stand from. I don't do this radio show uh, because I think we'll do well. I know we're going to beat tyranny. We don't have a choice. I was just being clear that by com sure. but by competing, by being involved, by going all the way and staying in the election all the way through, even as an independent, you win just by being involved and injecting real ideas. You know, uh, to use a sports analogy, you go to the playoffs. Sure, he can win the Super Bowl as well. Uh, obviously, play to win. I'm just saying you win by competing. You never uh, win if you don't. Absolutely. And, and maybe what you do, Alex, if you don't win this time, you lay the groundwork for the next guy to win. Exactly. You know, no, no, I understand that. It's a process that takes a while. I could never have been governor of Minnesota without the runs that Dean Barkley did before me. Because Dean Barkley was the man that got my party major party status in the state of Minnesota. Yes. And it took Dean Barkley to do that first before I ever would have had. If, if Dean hadn't have done that, there's no way that I would have won governor because I wouldn't have had major party status and I wouldn't have been included in the debates. Exactly. There are trailblazers that come before us and then each of us is a trailblazer for the next. Precisely. Precisely. So that's what needs to happen. Ron Paul needs to quit the Republican Party, get the nomination of the Libertarian Party. But he's got to. He, he, we, it can't be the. It has to be the Libertarian small L. Well, I did hear a little bird that that may be why. In fact, there's no maybe about it. He is probably. Well, I'm not going to say anything. Ron Paul is looking at what you're saying. I know that. Okay. Well, I hope so. I really hope so because. Ron has the power, and I think if the two of us, and I guarantee you that I, as I walk around today, you can't believe all the people that come up to me and ask me to run for president. Well, I want to talk more about that, but let me just get, tell you, Ron Paul's announced he's not running again for the House, so he'll be out in a year regardless. And the word is he is positioning to say when he quits the Republican Party that, hey, I'm serving out my term, I'm done, I'm leaving the party, and that he'd have to do that because he probably couldn't win that House seat later without the Republican engine, and that, sure. it, and that it is positioning for that. So I know Paul's looking at it. We need to make sure he knows he doesn't have a choice. Destiny and history has drafted him. And as you said, Governor, a lot of people, look, look, I know you personally. I know you behind the scenes. You are the real McCoy. That's why I admire you. You are a real person. You believe in what you believe in, and that's the end of it. You're not some puppet on a string. Neither is Ron Paul. And uh, Dennis Kucinich is a great guy, but he's not as libertarian as you guys are. And he said he might put Kucinich in his cabinet. Would you look at being in a Ron Paul cabinet if he won? I don't know. You know, it would depend on could I leave the Baja. <laughs> in fact, Alex, if I if I was his VP guy, could we move the VP down to the Baja? <laughs> no, because I mean the president and VP can't be together anyway, right? No, you, exactly. So I'll go down to the Baja then. As long as I can keep having my Baja winters of surfing, we got no problem. Well, I, you know, I've heard a lot of presidents want their uh, like George Washington had John Adams. They want their. Want, they want their vice president to uh, stay out of it. Well, and I would. I'd be happy to stay out of it. You know?
know, I'd just be there waiting in the wings to make sure nothing would happen to him. Okay, so officially you're saying you would take a VP spot with Ron Paul? I would give it very serious consideration. I can't tell you right now I would because my wife is not sitting next to me. Well, I'll tell you, anything, Terry. No, anything I would do of that nature, I would require to have to talk to her first because we've been married 36 years now, and I don't do much of anything without consulting her. Sure, she, sure, but if your other half... Ally. But if your better half said green light, then you're you're go. Well, there'd be a damn good chance of it. Wow, that is that is breaking news, Governor. I guarantee you, this is going to end up being in the news today. Well, amazing. We've only got about a minute and a half left. I hope folks get the uh, books briefly. Uh, tell us about when the TV show's coming back and about new books in the wings. Well, uh, Dick and I are working on another book that hopefully will be out right before the elections because the, it'll be a timely book dealing with the elections and. Uh, the TV show, we're in the middle of production, as I said right now. Unfortunately, we had this tragedy happen a couple days ago, uh, which we're looking into, of course, and we will probably cover it with the TV show because it was part of it. And uh, when we go on the air, I'm not really sure. I'm estimating that we'll be, uh, I'm, I'm officially to be done by December, the first part of December, the very first couple days of December. And so I would figure editing, I, I, just with a ballpark guess, I would say the eight episodes will probably start in January, but don't quote me, because I, that's the network's call, not mine. And uh, they could start them sooner, they could start them later. I'm not privy to that information, but there will be eight more shows. Very exciting. Governor, we're out of time. Okay, thanks, Alex. We'll talk again.